In this lesson, we're going to focus on Lewis dot structures. Now, this is going to take our understanding of Bohr diagrams a little bit further. Specifically, Lewis dot structures focus on the outer orbital and what's going on with the electrons out there. Why do we call them Lewis structures? Well, it's in honor of Gilbert Lewis, who coined the term covalent bond. And he discovered that by looking at these electrons in the outer orbital, that you can understand what they're doing and why they're doing it. So this will take us into um, our understanding of ionic bonding, which will come up just a little bit later, and covalent bonding, uh, which is a kind of sharing that goes on between uh, certain atoms. But for now, what might have struck your attention is that sodium has an electron sitting here. Magnesium seems to have two. Chlorine, which is really close to the end of the periodic table, has seven. Now, if you'll notice, chlorine, its atomic number isn't seven. But what we're looking at are the number of electrons only in its outside shell. And there's a pattern to this. And it really makes chemistry a lot simpler, right? If we look at some of these outer electrons, you'll see hydrogen, right? having one, carbon having four electrons only in its outer shell. The neat thing here is we don't have to draw the inner rings. And this helps us understand these bonds that are made. For example, if you look down here at nitrogen gas, it's triple bonding. So when nitrogen floats around, it floats around as something called N2 as a gas. And why does it stick to itself? How does it stick to itself? Well, Lewis dot structures help explain it all. Um, here we have a noble gas. And noble gases, we were talking about how their, their outer electron, uh, their outer orbital is full. And in the case of xenon, you'll see that it, unlike poor chlorine up there, has a nice full octet. Now, if we jump back to our, our sort of periodic table that I've been using, these ones here, helium, neon, argon, krypton, they're called noble gases because they are pretty much non-reactive and their outer orbital is full. They don't need to make bonds. It's, it's sort of like having everything you would ever need for electrons. You're full. You don't need any more. So let's take this a bit further. So Gilbert Lewis, who was... Uh, the dean of the College of Chemistry at the University of California, Berkeley, um, came up with this model. And it was kind of, it's a bit, of, a bit controversial. It's a bit ironic. He never won the Nobel Prize for it. And he sh I think he should have. This is a pretty impressive and very useful model for understanding bonding. He put, he represented electrons as little dots, right? And we've been seeing these, right? For example, if I draw in you know, the eight dots that would fill up a shell like this, right? He came up with the idea of just looking at only the outer shell, which was a good idea because it's the outer shell where bonding happens, where deals get made. And he came up with a term for this. He called it, or these electrons in these shells, valence electrons. And that's where the reactions are going to go on. The inner shells, not so much. So here's a quick look at the periodic table, and if we slightly older way of presenting it with the 1a, 2a, 3a, etc. But when we look at the periodic table in this instance, you notice here that hydrogen has one electron. And if you go down this chemical family, so does lithium, one electron in its outer shell. And not to be outdone, sodium has one electron in its outer shell. Folks one electron. Now, in chemical families, if you go to the second row, you might notice a pattern here. Two electrons in the outer shell. Same thing for magnesium, and we saw that just a minute ago. So as you begin to look at this, you're wondering, okay, these numbers up here really mean something. And they truly do. Because what they mean are the number of electrons that you will find in the outer shell. If you look down here, and I'm just going to, oops, I want to change my color. And it's fighting me like it usually does. I'll just go with red. 
three electrons in the outer shell. Aluminum, we don't need to show everything, three electrons in the outer shell. And this pattern of how many electrons are there lines up with what column are you in? First column, second column, third column, fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh, eighth. Now this is in the this is in the old periodic uh, notation. I'll show you what the newer table looks like. But we start to see some definite patterns. For example, we noticed in our previous video that chlorine, right, had seven valence, well, seven electrons in its outer shell. Now I can tell you that the outer shell electrons we refer to as valence electrons. Okay. Here's another way to look at it. In the periodic table, they, now in this case, they're just using Roman numerals, right? So let's show it this way. And this was, this is, this is obviously not showing the middle of the table, but in the older structures, it was kind of useful to number the periodic table along the top like that because you could keep track of the electrons, right? Everything here has one valence electron, right? And you notice here, everything has two. So I'm just gonna draw them as oval so it's a little bit more obvious for you, right? Come over to, well, we saw aluminum boron right above it, there's those three valence electrons, right? Carbon, well, it's in its chemical family, it has four valence electrons. So does its buddy silicon right down here. Hmm. So we're seeing a pattern emerge that the, depending on which column you're in, that says how many electrons in your, are in your outer shell, valence electrons. So, it's like, like a Bohr diagram, but there's a lot less work because you're only focusing on the outer orbital. So sodium, you could go and do a heck of a lot of work with sodium because seeing that it has 11 protons, that tells me I have to fill in, right, 11 electrons. And that, you have to do that 288 rule, right, for the stacking order. But if you look at where sodium is in the periodic table, and I'll jump back to my interactive table back here, sodium is in the very first column. So knowing it's in the first column leads me to believe it just has one electron in its outer shell. Okay, so we go back. Now when you see the electrons in a Bohr diagram, right, you literally have to do the one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. So you've done that many electrons. And then there's that one electron here. This one right there. So if you, when you look at some of our technology today, for example, you look at lithium, right? Lithium has, just like sodium, has one electron sitting in the outside. Now, I want to pique your interest because I want you to think about lithium ion batteries, which we find in everything from cameras to iPads to most of our electronic devices. If you look at a, a Tesla, those are lithium powered batteries, very powerful. That one outer electron, take note of it because it really matters. When we draw a Lewis structure, the nice thing now is you just write sodium, so you write down this atomic symbol, like that, and you draw the dot. Now what's even better now is you don't have to draw circles. We don't need this. This is gone, bye-bye. Now, if it was, well, let's say it was potassium, right, which is also, an, is also in the very first um, chemical family, uh, which we refer to as the alkali earth metals, we do the same thing. Potassium, one valence electron. Easy. Lewis dot structures really uh, simplify things for us. Um, they're, 
by allowing you to focus on how many electrons are in there out, outside, we could focus on how many electrons something wants to get or potentially get rid of. Helium, uh, you'll see down here, has two valence electrons. So what they're saying is you, we tend to draw the electrons in pairs, right? So you'll see the pair written in like that. When we're looking at, um, say, a noble gas, which has eight valence electrons, we draw in all the electrons, right, in a way where we show the dots um, coming together in pairs. What they're trying to show you down here, right, is depending on whichever element it is, and I, they're not referring to oxygen here, right? If something had two electrons, generally you draw it across from each other, right? As you progress, if it had four electrons, you go like this. And as it starts to get more pairs, right, there's a pairing up happening there, right? We're up to six in this case. If you're getting near the end of the periodic table, right, there's your seven, and then there's your noble gases, which have full outer shells. So two electrons together, right, we call that a lone pair. And in this case, you'll see that this is pretty lonely. This is what they're talking about here. Um, a stable octet, which is this, right? You'll have eight electrons in the outermost shell. Now, oops, Let's see if I can just do a little bit of erasing here for you. No, oh, it's fighting me. That's okay. Um, to be a noble gas, eight electrons in your outer shell. Now, in this case, when we're looking at the Bohr diagrams over here, right, they're not drawing the whole circle like this, right? In this case, they were just showing the edge of the electron orbital. And you can see that this takes a while. If you're fluorine, right, which is, has nine protons, you have to follow that good old 288 rule, right? And begin to fill the electrons. And in this case, they're just saying two E minuses, but I could draw that like this, right? And in this case, there would be seven of these, but I don't really have enough space for seven, which is why they've written seven electrons like that. We're totally moving past the Bohr diagrams. What's easier, if you look on the left and you look on the right, this, is the, these are the Lewis structures. So in a periodic table, there's some older ways. You'll see this. You'll see some older um, ways of noting it. Now, if I go back to a periodic table, um, you'll notice that there are 18 columns in the periodic table. Let's go back. Okay. So in our periodic table here, hydrogen, column one, beryllium, column two. Okay. Scandium, and you notice I'm going through these columns, right? But as I go through them, each one, I go across the periodic table, you're going to notice, if you count all the way across, there are 18 of these. Modern periodic tables write the number at the very top, one, two, three, four, five, etc., all the way till they get over to where fluorine is, that's 17, and helium is 18. What's happened is the rules about numbering the periodic table have kind of evolved and changed. They thought it was easier to just say there's 18 columns, chemical families. So, if we're looking, for example, at oxygen, which is in, right here, oxygen is in 16, right? It's the 16th column. Just pay attention to the last number, because that's all that matters. Six. Fluorine is in column 17. Again, it's like you just don't pay attention to the one. Look at the last number. Seven, right? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven electrons. Now, go back to sodium. You'll notice that it was in column one. Well, that's easy. Column one, one electron. Poof, we're done. We'll keep going. So, 
just some basic rules um, when it comes to when it comes to filling up your um, Lewis diagram. It's going to be magnesium. I'm going to, going to write magnesium like this, right? And I'm going to write nitrogen like this. So where is magnesium? Well, I go back to my periodic table and I look over here. Magnesium is in the second column. That leads me to believe it has two valence electrons. Okay. Coming back, two valence electrons, you write them like this. Poof, done. Nitrogen, well, where's it? Nitrogen is in the one, two, three, four, fifth, or 15th column, rather. So it's in column 15, so I know, heck, the last number is five. It has five valence electrons. So remember how to write it. North, south, east, west, and then make a pair like that. That's when you start adding the pairs. So there you go. Magnesium, two. Nitrogen, five. Fluorine. Uh, is in the 17th column. Oops. So fluorine, atomic symbol is what you put in there, and it's in column 17. I'm looking at the 7, and I just do this. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. Hmm. Argon, noble gas. Noble gases are in the 18th column. So let's write argon. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. And that gives it its full octet, its full shell. So that's pretty much done. And <laughs> the animations are coming in afterwards, but I like to draw them in myself. Now, some things to note. This is why Lewis, or Gilbert Lewis's um, ideas were so transformative, because by looking at that outer orbital, what he realized was noble gases have a valence shell that is full. The, the valence electrons, they're all there. So that must be what everything in the periodic table wants to do. You can't really change your nucleus. You can't change your protons, and you... You can't change your neutrons very easily, so your core is kind of stuck. But wouldn't it be nice if you could fill up all the electrons in your outer shell so you looked like a noble gas? I mean, you can't change your core, but you could fill up your electrons. And that's when elements start to make deals. So when you look at hydrogen, poor hydrogen has one electron in its outer, sh its outer shell, right? Although hydrogen and, and helium, they're, they're in that first period right, where there's only two elements. So what hydrogen really wants to do, if it could swing it, hydrogen would love to not only have one here, but it would love to have one here as well, right? Which can be a little bit hard to do. Is hydrogen going to be given one? Is it going to steal one? Like, what does it do? Because this is it as an atom, and we know that atoms, right, are neutral. One proton, one electron. But what I get to tell you now is atoms don't have to stay neutral. They just begin that way before the wheeling and dealing starts happening. So if you could fill your orbitals, what's being referred to here is fill up your inner orbital, fill up your next orbital, fill up the next one, try to get these octets. Then you'll be all happy and stable with all the electrons you could want, right? Eight valence electrons. That's the name of the game. So this is the reason why uh, Gilbert Lewis's ideas were so important, because they began to focus on what these deals were, this interaction between valence electrons. And we're talking, folks, about a chemical bond. And, for example, when we were talking about nitrogen, nitrogen floats around like this. makes a triple bond with itself. Well, if it wasn't for uh, the ideas that Lewis um, 
sort of contributed to the, the chemical community, this wouldn't have been understood, not nearly as well. Having a full valence shell is the name of the game. Everybody kind of wants to be electrically like a noble gas. Lewis diagrams. Okay, so this is where I'm actually going to stop, but I'll just set the stage a little bit. When atoms begin, they're electro electronically neutral. Okay, protons equal electrons. Okay, I've been harping on that like crazy. But if they can fill their shells, they will unbalance this. Right now, this is like your teeter-totter where protons and electrons are equal. But here's a problem. What about that octet, right? Filling up that outer shell. Now, this is where elements, the only thing that they can deal, the only cards they can give away are their electrons. And ladies and gentlemen, that is for the next lesson where we talk about these things called ions. If you get a chance, go to YouTube and look at what happens when you add sodium to water. And you'll see the element sodium go through a really interesting phase. Um, it will chemically react, catch on fire, and potentially explode. And you would wonder, well, why, why does sodium have such an overreaction when it comes into contact with water? Go check it out. Sodium added to water. Why does it react so violently? Well, that's a topic I'll address in my next video. Kind of like to create a little cliffhanger. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, that's it. Lewis diagrams. Finito.